Okay, y'all. We'll get started. I hope everybody has managed to find a, a box of lunch and feel free to eat while we talk. My name is Heidi Hurd. I am the co-director of the Illinois Program in Law and Philosophy, and I welcome you to this, this celebratory occasion, because these are the great days in the Academy um, when we can gather together and celebrate the achievements of our colleagues and congratulate ourselves for having the collective wisdom to co-opt their successes to our own institutional advantage. And today, there's a great deal of self-congratulations that are in order. Um, because our colleague, Colleen Murphy, Murphy, has succeeded in publishing yet another already acclaimed book, one that's sure to redefine uh, the terms of the debate about whether and when countries can claim to be justly transitioning to justice after emerging from tragic periods of bloody civil strife, appalling human rights abuses, and catastrophic human displacement. So titled The Conceptual Foundations of Transitional Justice, this field-altering work has already uh, received um, editorial reviews that have described it as an outstanding analysis, ambitious, novel, a game changer, and a must read for anyone interested in the practice and theory of post-conflict nation building. Now we are delighted today that a number of the members of the Murphy family uh, can be with us to join in this celebration of achievement. I want to welcome Colleen's parents right here, Kathleen and Robert Murphy, her sister Mary Beth <laughs> Murphy right, be right next to them, her brothers Kevin and Jack over here towards the end, and her sister-in-law between them, Sandra, and her husband, Paolo. Where's Paolo? Right here, right in front of me. Her husband, Paolo Gardoni. <laughs> Paolo is an excellence faculty scholar in civil and environmental engineering. He's the co-director of the Societal Risk Management Program and the director of the Multi-Hazard Approach to Engineering Center um, here at the University of Illinois. So this is a serious Illinois power couple. Okay, um, before I introduce the principal players in today's symposium discussion, I want to um, welcome to the podium the College of Laws most enthusiastic champion of scholarly accomplishment, Dean Vicamar, to give some welcoming words. Well, it's really great to see uh, all of you and so many of you here today to celebrate uh, this uh, wonderful occasion. Uh, let me uh, begin by echoing and amplifying my illustrious predecessor, Heidi's uh, welcome to everybody. Probably what I enjoy most about my job as dean is the chance that it gives me to learn about the range of exciting work done by my colleagues, not just here in the law school, but throughout um, uh, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign campus. Um, probably what I find most frustrating is that I don't really have time to wallow in the richness of the offerings uh, the way I would prefer. Uh, case in point, um, in 15 minutes or so, I have to go to Swanland for a meeting. And those of you who know campus know that Swanland, that's our central administration building, is, is a place where you have a lot of boring meetings. <laughs> but such is life. So for now, um, uh, please allow me to extend my personal and hearty congratulations uh, to Colleen and to soak up as much of her and your all's insights uh, as I can. Uh, so thank you again for coming. All right, so we're going to begin today's session with uh, Colleen Murphy, who will give us a brief overview of her book. Colleen is jointly appointed at Illinois in law, philosophy, and political science. She's also the director of the Women and Gender in Global Perspectives program. She received her master's and her doctorate degrees in philosophy from the University of North Cal Carolina at Chapel Hill after obtaining her bachelor's degree from Notre Dame. Before coming to Illinois, she was a Lawrence S. Rockefeller Visiting Faculty, faculty Fellow at Princeton, and she served on the Faculty of Philosophy at Texas A&M University. Now, the book that we celebrate today, this one, is her fourth book. Her first book uh, in the general area of transitional justice was entitled, or is entitled, A Moral Theory of Political Reconciliation, 
also published by Cambridge Press. And she has co-edited volumes on engineering ethics for a globalized world and risk analysis of natural hazards. She's also the author of an impressive portfolio of articles published in leading law reviews and peer-edited philosophy journals. And she has a fifth book currently under contract on climate change and its impacts, which is sure to give us another excuse for a party. <laughs> Joining us today, and next to uh, Colleen in order, is uh, Mark Drumble from Washington and Lee University, the class of 1975 alumni professor of law and director of the Transnational Law Institute. He received his undergraduate degree from McGill University, his JD and his LLM degree from Toronto, his MA jointly from the Institute of Political Studies in Paris and McGill University, and his SJD <coughs> from Columbia University. He's held scholarly appointments around the globe, and he has taught international law in Pakistan, Finland, Uganda, the Netherlands, Italy, and Brazil. He is a celebrated author of two major works that have won multiple awards. His first from Cambridge University Press entitled Atrocity Punishment and International Law, and his second from Oxford University Press entitled Reimagining Child Soldiers in International Law and Policy. He also has an impressive resume of experience in the practice of international arbitration and litigation, serving, for example, as defense counsel in the Rwandan genocide trials and as co-counsel for the Canadian chief of defense staff before the Royal Commission that investigated military wrongdoing in the UN Somalia mission. So we're very honored to have you with us today, Mark. Our second commentator today is one of our own. Jessica Greenberg is an associate professor and the director of undergraduate studies in anthropology at Illinois. But it seems that everybody on this campus wants a piece of her because she holds appointments in the Center for Global Studies, the European Union Center, the LAS Department of Global Studies, and the Department of Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. She's a busy lady. Um, she received her bachelor's degree from Columbia University, her master's and PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago. And she's also uh, the author of a book published by Stanford University Press entitled After the Revolution, Youth, Democracy, and the Politics of Disappointment in Serbia, which has received a great deal of scholarly and journalistic attention. So Jessica, thanks for venturing south of the quad to join us for this. And finally, our third commentator today is Daniel Philpott, a professor of political science at Notre Dame who specializes in international relations and political theory. Dan received his undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia and his master's and PhD in government from Harvard University. Before moving to Notre Dame, he was on the faculty of political science at UC Santa Barbara. He works pr principally on the intersection of religion and global politics and has published several award-winning books that focus on the convergence of these forces, including a book entitled Revolutions in Sovereignty, How Ideas Shape Modern International Relations uh, that was published by Princeton, and a co he's co-authored a book entitled God's Century, Resurgent Religion and Global Politics by Norton Press. And his Oxford Press book, Just and Unjust Peace, An Ethic of Political Reconciliation, grew out of his work with leaders in the Catholic Church to develop a plan for political reconciliation in the Great Lakes region of Africa. And his work for the Fetzer Institute in Uganda resulted in scholarship that has been much cited on the role of forgiveness in peace building. So Dan, again, thank you for making the journey to Illinois for this occasion. One last note before I turn it over to this uh, panel. Uh, after this session, you will find copies of Colleen's book in the College of Laws foyer for sale. You will find a table out there where these are being sold. I urge you to take this opportunity to secure a copy so that you can get its famous author to sign it for you. And now to tell you what you're going to get for your money, let me uh, hand the podium over to Colleen. Thanks, Colleen. So first of all, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for the generous introduction, Heidi, and thank you to Heidi and Michael, who co-direct the Illinois Program in Research in Law and Philosophy that's sponsoring this talk. And thanks to Vic. I think he might have already left. There he is. Thank you, Vic, for the warm words of welcome. Um, it's appropriate that my family is here today because I started writing this book when I was pregnant with my oldest son. And so as he approached the age of seven, I realized that his entire lifetime had been spent with his mom consumed by the project that, that is reflected in this book. 
and it was time for the book to be done. So his, <laughs> and so I appreciate them being here. I appreciate Mark and Jessica and Dan for taking the time to read the book. And what I thought I would do by way of background and to set up the discussion we have is to give you why th the question that I'm trying to answer in this book and why it was a question that um, took me very long to try and figure out how to answer. So we're all familiar of thinking about different kinds of justice. Even if the labels aren't familiar, the concepts are. We can think about or are familiar with appeals to retribution or retributive justice as one way of understanding what the state is up to when it prosecutes and upon conviction punishes those who are responsible for what we might think of as ordinary criminality. So one individual has sexually assaulted or raped another, one individual has murdered another. And so the thought behind retributive justice is that justice requires that those who have done certain kinds of egregious wrong suffer proportional punishment proportional to the wrong that they are responsible for inflicting. We're also familiar with the thought of corrective justice, which is reflected in tort law, or at least is one way of understanding tort law, which deals with the risks that our actions with one another create and takes up the question of what's the appropriate way to allocate losses that may result from our actions when our actions lead to harm upon others. Think of car accidents or ordinary cases in which losses, sometimes wrongful losses, occur and we've got a question of who ought to appropriately bear these losses. And finally, we're familiar with ideas of distributive justice, which are concerned with how the benefits, and in particular income and wealth, that social cooperation make possible, how that ought to be distributed and on what basis. On the basis of desert, on the basis of merit, on the basis of need, on the basis of exercises of liberty, which is reflected in, among other things, how our tax laws are created. What I was interested in was a question of justice that didn't seem to fit any of these categories. And that is, what counts as, or what are we doing when we're trying to achieve justice when the wrongs that are at issue are not ordinary criminal acts, but are acts in which the state is often implicated, either by being responsible for its infliction or giving permission to those who inflicted such harms, or are wrongs committed by groups that are politically oriented and, and involved in contestation of those who are de facto in charge of a state. When wrongdoing is not exceptional, an exception to the rule, but becomes normalized, a basic fact of life around which individuals have to orient their conduct so that you have to take into account the prospect of being arrested if you speak out against the government, even if it's legally permissible to do so. You have to take into account the fact that you might be kidnapped if you go in certain places, even though kidnapping may be legally prohibited to do. And when wrongs are committed against a background of pervasive inequality in wealth, in rights that are recognized and respected, in educational opportunities, in the ability of different groups of citizens to shape the terms of political interaction themselves. And where the inequality that you find is not a product of merit or a product of effort, but it's a product of arbitrary biases and the freedoms that different groups of indi individuals enjoy. And when you're responding to wrongdoing against this background and in a context of profound and deep uncertainty, where there's an aspiration to end conflict or end repression, but it's profoundly unclear if that's what's going to happen. And so you face the question of what is at stake in how you choose to deal with past wrongs is not just the fate of a particular perpetrator or a particular victim, but also the fate of a community in a sense, the broader trajectory of a community, and whether or not there'll be an end to conflict, as we see right now in Colombia, or whether there will be democracy as, or not, as we saw in South Africa following its transition to apartheid. So these cluster of questions have come up in dozens of societies globally over the past decades. In Colombia, in South Africa, in Rwanda, in Sri Lanka, in Guatemala, El Salvador, Argentina, Germany, Spain, countries comprising the former Yugoslavia, and when we think of our own history here in the United States, at different moments in our own period of time, historically following the end of the Civil War, in the context of the Civil Rights Movement, and for many today, in the issues that the aftermath of Charlottesville raises. And so, 
the question of how you deal with wrongs, is it through a process of a truth commission where you document patterns of abuse and create a historical record? Is it through criminal trials at the domestic level or international level or at some hybrid uh, sort of formation? <coughs> do you use reparations? Do you use amnesty? Do you do nothing? Um, these sorts of questions about what tools you use to deal with the past has in part led to the multidisciplinary field of transitional justice that my book begins to engage or is a, hopefully a contribution to. But it also raises questions that citizens of transitional societies, victims and perpetrators, as well as international observers, care deeply about that justice be done in the aftermath of wrongdoing and it's a question about which there is profound disagreement about what the answer to that question is. Disagreement that was reflected in the divided vote in Colombia when the national plebiscite was held to ratify or to support the final accord to end 52 years of conflict. And as part of the terms of that accord, deal with or establish processes to deal with the 8 million registered victims of displacement, killing, kidnapping, torture, rape, and other forms of sexual violence. It divided South Africans, both during the proceedings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and South Africans now, as they think about what the legacy of the Truth and Reconciliation is. And it's echoed in our own debates and discussions here in the United States when we think about the placement of, of Confederate memorials, how is it appropriate to memorialize the past? What is it that should be memorialized? And what does what we choose to do or refrain from doing say about our relations now and our re relations moving forward? So my book tries to articulate a framework for thinking about what counts as doing justice to past wrongs. Um, what it means to do pa deal with past wrongs in a context of a transition away from conflict and repression where wrongs of this kind occurred. And the starting point for my answer is um, a philosopher, 18th century philosopher David Hume, who very famously claimed that whenever we're talking about questions of justice, we have to recognize that a set of circumstances of justice generate a particular problem of justice that principles of justice help provide guidance for us addressing. And what I take Hume's insight to be is that principles of justice are always context dependent. They become salient in a particular set of circumstances. And so if we want to understand what justice demands in transitions, we have to understand those contexts and those circumstances. And the circumstances that I articulate are largely reflected in the questions I started out um, raising about the background of pervasive inequality, about the fact that wrongdoing is political and has become normalized, and the background of broader uncertainty about where a society is heading. And I claim that the salient moral question or problem of justice that arises in this circumstance is, what constitutes the just pursuit of societal transformation? Whereby societal transformation we're asking about fundamentally altering the political relationships among citizens and between citizens and officials, transforming the ways in which citizens interact with one another and with government officials. And we're doing that or pursuing that requires dealing with profound dimensions of distrust among different groups of citizens or with respect to citizens and officials dealing and strengthening with institutions like legal institutions and dimin diminishing the gap between what legal rules say and how they're enforced, as well as addressing other challenges like those stemming from poverty. And then I note that insofar as you're trying to do this, trying to transform relationships, but doing it in a way that takes up past wrongs that had particular perpetrators and particular victims, you have to do so in a way that treats victims and perpetrators fittingly and appropriately not just as mere means, tools, for the sake of the pursuit of broader societal transformation or some broader societal engineering project, but also recognizing, citing another philosopher, that citizen, the victims and perpetrators are also ends in themselves, individuals who have a claim to be treated fairly and appropriately given either what they experienced or what they are responsible for doing. So I'll end there. That's kind of a broad sketch of the question. and. Um, some brief remarks on my answer, and, and now I'll turn it over to the panelists.
Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Heidi, thank you for the introduction and for creating a context here of the true life of the mind. And when one thinks of the life of the mind, one thinks about talking about really tough questions. And thank you, Colleen, for recognizing how tough the questions are and how the joy in thinking about and thinking through tough issues is part of a journey. The destination may matter less than the trip. And in this regard, your book is a jewel. It's a jewel because it asks tough questions and you ask them beautifully. And at the same time, you take the reader's hand and lead the reader down a path in which there is not just being talked to, but there is being talked about, and not just being talked at, but talking with. And the flow and the cadence of your ideas and your prose, I think, not only contributes to a space of thought, but as I said before, a journey that is looking at a lot of painful things, but looks at them with a sense of optimism. And what I want to do in my remarks here is talk a little bit about what I think is one of the most painful questions. And it maps onto what you just told us here, namely the reality that acts of atrocity are extraordinary, but in part, in large part, they're extraordinary because it is ordinary people together that commit them. And this, in my mind, and we're of the same mind when it comes to this one point, is what differentiates atrocity, genocide, massive human rights abuses from ordinary criminal acts in ordinary times. An atrocity would never metastasize without the involvement of the many. It's the handiwork of the many that leads to the collectivization of violence. And sure, the collectivization of violence may be orchestrated by the few and the powerful, but it is the handiwork of the masses that render it truly massive. And I want to talk a bit about the masses. The masses are people that, for example, as Heidi, you mentioned, I represented in Rwanda, ordinary people. But among people who are ordinary, who commit atrocity and without which atrocity wouldn't happen, one actually finds a diversity of people. You, Colleen, in your book and also in your remarks, talk about victims and perpetrators as categories. But the reality of atrocity on the ground is that victims hurt others and themselves become victimizers, and the lines between perpetrator and victim are often a lot fuzzier than one might think. The persecuted may come to persecute other members of the same group, whether because of survival pressures, whether because of wanting to get ahead, or whether because in times of violence, acts of atrocity and receiving the pain of atrocity tend to be somewhat overlapping. And the question that I want to ask is this. In context where the lines between victims and perpetrators may be fluid, who owes what to whom? Are some people owed something because they have suffered pain when they themselves may owe something because they themselves have hurt others along the way? Can one be entitled and also obliged? And people who are hurt by the acts of other victims, how should they speak of the pain that they may have suffered? Who will listen to them? You mentioned, Heidi, I wrote a book on child soldiers, and the child soldier is a good starting point for this. When we close our eyes and we think of the child soldier, we think of a victim, drugged, tortured, brutalized. But that person, that child, may maim and mangle other people. How should the person who has been hurt by the acts of a child soldier speak of what happened to her? In my experience, victims who are hurt by the acts of other victims are often in one of the most difficult places because when they speak of the fact that they may have been hurt 
by another victim. Their interlocutor, the person to whom they are speaking, generally has the following reaction. You know, it wasn't that kid's fault. They didn't know what they were doing. They were forced, they were drugged, they were used and abused. And the eyes of the person to whom the story of the pain that you have received at the hands of another victim, that person's eyes, your listener, then tend to drift away and that person tends to respond in a way that says, look, I know you were hurt, but the victim was the person who hurt you. And it is not clear in my life experience whether the fact that you were hurt by an innocent necessarily dulls the pain that you feel yourself at having been hurt. And I've become very interested in these particular questions. How do we speak about the pain that victims cause to other victims? Child soldiering is one example. I've started a large research project now that looks at the capo. The capo are inmates of the concentration camps, Auschwitz, who were recruited from within the prison population. 10% of the prisoners in the Nazi death camp served in administrative functions over those camps. Some volunteered, some were cajoled, some were coerced. And it's fascinating to me if you read Holocaust survival literature, Primo Levi, Imre Kertesz, Katsetnik, these authors that have immortalized the Holocaust experience. In their books, in general, the Germans and the Nazis are the backdrop. They create the stage. But they're generally the people that create the walls. The people on the stage in those books, the stories, the protagonists, the antagonists, are the prisoners and their relationships amongst and between each other. The camaraderie, the affection, the support, but also the betrayals, the connivances, the abuses. As Primo Levi writes, the major law of the lager, the concentration camp, was eat your own bread and that of your neighbor as well. And those stories matter. Being hurt by another victim matters. And to whom should one tell that particular story? And how should one tell it? Primo Levi disclaimed the space of a trial as being the appropriate place in which to prosecute a victim, a persecuted person who yet persecuted another. The state of Israel felt differently. In the 1950s, ran approximately 40 trials called the Kapo trials in which Jewish individuals who had moved to Israel after the war were prosecuted as being Nazi collaborators when they served these leadership functions in the death camps. The trials were gnarly and awkward and largely unsuccessful, which I think is a good place to be. But at the end of the day, the story remains. How to speak of this particular pain, which matters because survivors press forward to talk about their stories, and the identity of the perpetrator should not negate your ability to talk about what happened to you as a victim. And that brings me to you and your book. I think what you do in your book is deliver a set of tools by which this conversation can happen. I know in your book you rely on categories of victim and perpetrator that I would push back a little bit on, and I know you push back on that yourself through this phraseology of complex victims. Well, Colleen, I think what your book has, even though it reposes in these categories, is a set of tools, devices, and language in which one can really speak of how to create a conversational and transitional space for the necessity of all victims to speak about what happened to them, regardless whether the person who did it to them was forced, compelled, or just selfish in doing it. Your elaboration of the concept of trust, your emphasis on the need for social repair and relational transformation, your development of holistic approaches, the courage you write that, for example, forgiveness is not enough suggests to me the following, and on this I'll conclude. I think there is no theory, no philosophical or criminological theory upon which to say that it is fair 
to criminally prosecute someone who is obliged to serve as a barracks leader or leader of a forced labor group in Auschwitz who beat up other prisoners and killed some. I don't think deterrence, retribution work in that context. But the joy in your book is looking beyond law and recognizing that the conversation about transition is a journey a journey where it matters less where we may go than the act of journeying in the first place. And for me, what I see in your work is an enormous assist for me, myself, and my own thinking, and the thinking of others for some of the toughest questions that we so shirk, I think, when we think about moving beyond atrocity. Namely, what do you do with the most tragic of perpetrators? What do you do with the most imperfect of victims? And what do you do with the violence that they inflict on others? I think you point us in the right direction. Congratulations. So I also want to say um, thank you so much uh, to Heidi for organizing this, to, to Colleen for, uh, for writing the book. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to engage with, and I have to say it's, it's not often that you're working through a set of questions and problematics. I've been thinking about the relationship between social context and law a lot in the past few months, and you, you light on a book that actually all of a sudden things begin to crystallize, right? And, and to be in conversation with you around that through the book was really, really wonderful and I look forward, forward to more. I also have to note that the last time I was in this room I was sitting in that back corner taking my con law final and it's a lot more fun to be up here than it is in, in that in the hot seat. So, okay. Uh, so I'm going to take the sort of privilege of the discipline to begin with a brief ethnographic vignette and then move on to discussion of, of the book. Just over 20 years ago, I spent a summer in the ruins of a small Croatian town. I was one of several people to join the Pokrats Project, a hopeful band of long and short-term volunteers doing reconstruction and reconciliation in a town that had been 70% destroyed during the Croatian Operation Storm in 1995. The short-term volunteers hailed from the U.S. and across Europe, from stable democracies to the still nascent transitional context of Northern Ireland, Poland, and elsewhere. The long-term volunteers had grown up in Croatia, the last generation born into brotherhood and unity, and coming of age in the shadow of ethnic cleansing. Together as a community, we both tried to make sense of and live post-conflict transition through small everyday acts the kind of tentative approaches to rebuilding the social world that are so common in early post-war contexts. Early in my stay, I found myself alone in the yard of the group house after our daily collective evening meal. We'd spent the day digging out the rubble of a house that had been burned to the ground. We had listened to people's stories of loss and fear and shared the meager food and homemade brandy <laughs> that people reared on the ethic of stranger hospitality had scraped together to welcome us. As I sat alone in the darkening evening, I struggled to make sense of extreme loss and the scars of violence all around me. In that moment, far from home and alone, I reached for some way to order my relationship to the world. Not particularly religious, I nonetheless found myself quietly muttering a prayer, the mourner's Kaddish, a Jewish prayer said in memory of the dead. The Kaddish is unique in that despite being uttered in mourning, it never mentions loss. Rather, it references the divine creative power to make and remake the world. The prayer was a small attempt to hold together the torn social fabric of the world around me, if only for a moment, if only with words. I start with this brief reflection because it's long captured for me the affective space of post-war transition, something that I've spent the many years since that summer researching. The post-war context is defined by an experience of loss unique to the destruction of all social certainty and the ethical domains in which it is grounded. For me, one of Colleen's achievements in her book is how fully she captures the emotional, ethical, and social urgency of transitional justice in the face of such a loss. Her language for describing the scene of post-war violence is technical and sober. Notions such as existential uncertainty, pervasive structural inequality, normalized collective and political wrongdoing. 
But in many ways, it is the systematicity with which she analyzes this context that does justice to precisely the experience of post-war violence. She systematically demonstrates the different needs to which transi transitional justice must respond. The layers of institutional exclusion of the apartheid state, the intimate violence of a revolutionary uprising turned to civil war in Syria. In so doing, she shows that a genuine response to transitional justice requires us to reshape social and ethical relationships at their core. In writing this book, she's offered us standards of justice around which we might collectively orient. It is thus a hopeful call to act to remake the world and a pragmatic pathway to do so. As a philosopher, Colleen explores the moral dimensions of agency, the conditions under which people experience their capacity to shape their world in the image of the good. Notions such as capability, which she defines, quote, as the genuine opportunity or freedom open to an individual to do or become something of value, unquote, tied together a sense of individual subjectivity with the human need to express that self in shaping and acting on the world around us. She is attuned to the tentative nature of ethics and the way that our best sense of self flourishes and founders in the project of building meaningful human connections or relationalities, as she talks about them. To explore the ethics of agency in a context of total social upheaval would alone be a meaningful contribution. But in calling for transitional justice to respond to both past wrongdoings and future social transformation, she does much more. By redefining transitional justice in terms of its institutional as well as subjective stakes, she demonstrates that law is adequate to the task of addressing systemic and social wrongs, such as normalized collective and political wrongdoing, or the fundamentally unequal distributions of power and access, as well as the kinds of violence that are so often the subject of individualized criminal proceedings in post-war adjudicatory processes. Thus, Colleen poses philosophical questions of how we assess and name moral culpability, but she's not satisfied with the too often individualizing, retrospective, and overly procedural mechanisms of moral judgment in existing legal frameworks. In theorizing transitional justice specifically, Colleen offers a pathway forward for law as a collective mechanism of social change. Colleen also shows us that how we name and recognize justice is a fundamentally intersubjective process. Moral judgments are necessarily social judgments. And it is precisely on that intersubjective terrain that a shared politics takes place. She begins with an appreciation of the socially generative work that law as a normative system can do. Legal systems are very efficient mechanisms for generating internally consistent logics for categorizing, predicting, and judging human action. In analyzing the logics of different types of legal response, Colleen shows us how law as a system for producing social predictability is not inherently good or bad. The safeguards of contractual arrangements allow for the smooth and regular conduct of business. Sanctions for behavior must be reasonably foreseeable for the law to be fair. Mechanisms for assessing criminal culpability take into account the link between states of mind, intentionality, and the consequences of our action. But Colleen does not stop at the normative structure of the law. She bends a morally neutral legal architecture in pursuit of the good. I think of it as a kind of a hack. You hack to the law. She does so by arguing that transitional justice can encompass both a response to wrongdoings of the past and by arguing that it must be the pursuit of social transformation in the future. Thus, it's not enough to respond to the symptoms of violence. In wedding the terms of analysis for contemporary revolution, and I think it's interesting in telling that you cite the Arab Spring as an example here, to those of transitional justice, Colleen brings something of the political back to the study of the law. Transitional justice here is not merely a technical fix, but an opportunity to refound the social order. Thus, transitional justice offers us parameters through which communities in transition can generate shared norms through common points of focus, the rule of law, frameworks for governance, ethical orientations towards the past. One of the many things I respect about this book is that Colleen's willing to take a stand on what the substance of a transformative social good ought to be. Transitional justice is thus not about an absence of violence, but a transformation of the deep forms of structural inequality that shape post-conflict societies. At the same time, she holds open the possibility that democracy need not be perfect to be successful. Too often in post-conflict contexts, the complex process of transitional justice is dismissed with universalizing metrics, terms like failed states or failed democracy. Colleen shows us a way forward out of one-size-fits-all models for assessing freedom, democratic success, or failure. 
She asks how we can assess justice without abandoning either an appreciation of social specificity or our commitment to a better, less unequal world. So from an anthropological perspective, I have some questions, I'm filled with questions about the scale and scope of this better community that we might imagine through transitional justice. I think it's important to note that while the case studies in the book focus on national conflicts, the possibility for transitional justice may exceed our understanding of the nation state as a particular container. Just as Colleen theorizes the specificity of transitional justice as its own type of moral and pragmatic space, I think she also shows that internationalizing law opens up possibility for more, more robust conceptions of justice. And as you note, justice is a scalar concept. I'd love to hear more about that. I'd like to hear more about how the scale of transitional justice can better inform how we might learn or teach the distinction between domestic and international regime, legal regimes. How might your unique understanding of transitional justice help us to reimagine the social good and the project of transformation outside the boundaries, boundaries of the nation state conflicts that have so defined transitional justice studies since the end of the Cold War? Can we scale this project of founding a new ethical world through shared processes of democratic deliberation and rule of law? But this is perhaps too much to ask for one book. For now, <laughs> it's for your next, the one after next. For now, Colleen's book speaks to a deeply human impulse, the need to make sense of chaos, to structure something out of nothing, and to imagine our better worlds collectively. Transitional justice must respond to the most foundational questions about what makes us human when nothing is certain. From the physical ruins of a post-war town, burned out houses, heavily mined fields, poisoned wells, to the social ruins of <laughs> wartime violence, transitional justice must allow us to rebuild the taken for granted that make people's lives meaningful. Like The Mourner's Kaddish, Colleen's book is written in the shadow of death and loss. But also like the Kaddish, it is a tribute to the creative powers to make and remake the world. We can use the tools of ethics and the language of law to build something out of nothing, to fill a void with a process that honors social justice, social transformation, and democracy. Colleen's book is thus at heart both pragmatic and utopian, a prayer for peace and an incitement to action. Well, it is such an honor to comment on Colleen Murphy's new book on transitional justice, which I believe is an outstanding success and deserves to be regarded as one of the leading accounts of transitional justice. Colleen succeeds both in showing that transitional justice is a distinct circumstance or context of justice and how transitional justice can be a compelling substantive concept of justice. It is a compassionate book, attentive to the many dimensions of healing that must take place in the wake of these massive um, injustices, one that I commend to everyone. It is out of deep sympathy and admiration for the aims and achievements of Colleen's book that I would like to pay it the tribute of engaged critique, focusing on our second task, the substantive context of transitional justice. What I would like to argue is that Colleen's substantive concept of transitional justice is in fact one and the same as the concept widely known as restorative justice. Were Colleen to accept this argument, it would in no way negate her intricate and well-defended claims, but it would serve the cause of unity and conceptual progress in the global con conversation about transitional justice and would fortify a widely recognized school of thought. Restorative justice is a concept of justice that has arisen within stable Western democracies to address crime within communities, especially that involving juveniles. Several theorists, though, have sought to expand restorative justice to entire societies addressing past injustices. Restorative justice articulates all of the major core features of Colleen's concept of transitional justice, including the very features that, in my view, make it so compelling a central stress on relationship, a holistic and interdependent approach to harms and restorative practices, the participation of relevant stakeholders, the retributive insight that justice must address wrong and guilt, take seriously the perpetrator and the victim and their dignity, as you said, 
and a conception of crime and its redress that is brought into the wide web of victims, harms, and perpetrators. Restorative justice, in my view, is virtually synonymous with another concept familiar to political transitions, reconciliation, which is the holistic restoration of right relationship. Reconciliation, of course, was the central concept that Colleen defended in her last book. And on page 120 of the present book, she notes the close link between reconciliation and her rendering of transitional justice. If reconciliation and restorative justice are also one and the same, then Colleen herself points to the resonance of her thinking with restorative justice. Now, early in the present book, Colleen explicitly considers restorative justice, but declines its invitation. Her reason? Restorative justice centers upon forgiveness, which she explains does not properly belong in the justice of societal transitions. In fact, though, the restorative justice literature itself does not necessarily center forgiveness. True, some theorists of political restorative justice include forgiveness. I am one of them, as, as is far more prominently Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, whose book No Future Without Forgiveness weaves forgiveness tightly into the fabric of restorative justice. But the broad literature on restorative justice including some of its most distinguished theorists like John Braithwaite and Howard Zare, does not integrate forgiveness actively into restorative justice. So Colleen would well render her theory, could well res render her theory restorative justice while maintaining her skepticism of forgiveness. I wish to argue further, however, that forgiveness ought to be included in restorative justice and reconciliation in collective political transitional context and to enter into a dialogue with Colleen about her reasoning about it, which she spells out in page, pages 23 and 24, echoing her previous book's position. Incidentally, Colleen is one of several authors, indeed, who center on the concept of reconciliation, but are skeptical and cherry of forgiveness, Ernesto Verdeja, Andrew Schopp, and others. <clears throat> now, Colleen makes clear that she has no objection to forgiveness in interpersonal context where basic background conditions like reciprocity and respect are in place. I'm confident that her husband, Paolo, will appreciate this. <laughs> and members of her family, who I got to know over dinner last night. <clears throat> However, she argues, when these background conditions are not in place, as is the case with war and dictatorship, forgiveness is a no-go. It is a passive, submissive response that can serve to maintain conditions of oppression or injustice, and fails to recognize the value of anger or resentment, which can be critical to the self-worth and self-respect of victims, she maintains. And I think Colleen is not wrong about this. Forgiveness can go wrong um, in all these ways. And yet I want to argue for a different way of thinking about forgiveness, and to show, if briefly, how it can help construct right relationships in transitional political orders. I draw not only upon arguments about what forgiveness is, but also upon an empirical investigation of forgiveness in the wake of armed conflict that I conducted in Uganda, a country whose experience Colleen reflects upon towards the end of her book. Through a nationwide survey of 640 inhabitants of five regions where armed violence took place, 10 focus groups, and 27 in-depth interviews, I investigated these claims. Now, forgiveness is actually not foreign to countries facing gargantuan violent past. A discourse of forgiveness could be found in South Africa, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Guatemala, Chile, Northern Ireland, Germany, Timor-Leste, and numerous other transitional countries. Global leaders, most notably Tutu and Pope John Paul II, have advocated in the political realm as well. Discourse does not mean just practice, of course, but it does establish that forgiveness is not merely the brainchild of scholars sitting in offices in Western universities. Defense begins with definition. Colleen says that forgiveness is a matter of overcoming anger and resentment, which it is, in part. But I hold that forgiveness also involves another dimension, a will to construct right relationship. The forgiver wills to construe a perpetrator as one against whom he no longer holds an offense and to treat the perpetrator accordingly. This critical component of forgiveness helps to reframe forgiveness as something other than a passive acquiescence to injustice, which it might be were it merely a matter of relinquishment. Now the forgiver is an active, constructive agent who seeks to build peace, 
both with respect to the perpetrator, but also in context of political injustice in the society that badly needs to address its past injustices. In becoming an active constructor, the forgiver arguably regains agency rather than reinforces her passive position. Importantly, forgiveness does not condone, but rather presupposes a full identification and condemnation of injustices. It shares this construal with resentment, and like resentment, seeks to overcome or defeat this injustice, albeit in a different manner. Indeed, in contributing to restoring relationship, forgiveness arguably enact the transitional justice of restored relationships. The constructive character of forgiveness can be seen in the case of Angelina Atyam, a Ugandan mother of a girl whom the Lord's Resistance Army abducted from a girls' school along with 130 other girls in 1996. Meeting with other parents of abducted daughters in a local church, Atyam sensed a call to forgive, which she followed. She even sought out the mother of the LRA soldier who held her daughter in captivity and through her forgave the soldier along with his entire clan. When the soldier later died in the conflict, Atyam sought out the mother and wept with her. Atyam became a public advocate for forgiveness, which she believed could greatly contribute to peace. Other prominent cases of forgiveners, forgivers who actively constructed better social worlds might be mentioned as well. Nelson Mandela, for instance. Both Mandela and Atyam also illustrate that forgiveness is compatible with other kinds of efforts to build justice. Mandela actively sought the demise of apartheid and spent 26 years in prison for it. Atyam and the other parents formed an association to advocate for the girl's release. When Joseph Kony, the leader of the LRA, felt threatened by the international exposure that these efforts elicited, he approached Atyam and offered to release her daughter if she and the other parents would cease their efforts. Atyam refused. She would only cease if all the girls were released. No passive acquiescence to injustice can be found here. I have argued that there are theoretical reasons why forgiveness is incompatible with judicial punishment, reparations, oh, sorry, why it's compatible, why it's compatible with judicial punishment, reparations, the telling of truth, and public apologies on the part of a perpetrators, all of which provide compensation or vindication to victims. Ugandans agree. The survey showed victims being widely sympathetic towards all of these measures, but also, interestingly, willing to practice forgiveness even when these measures were absent, as they by and large were in Uganda. Are Atyam and Mandela rare saints? Here is where the survey is telling. It revealed that 68% of Ugandans who suffered violence in context of war exercised forgiveness. 86% agreed with the statement that it is good to exercise forgiveness in the aftermath of armed violence. These startlingly high numbers were corroborated in the focus groups, where participants offered thoughtful reflections on forgiveness, including some of its liabilities, but in no case argued that forgiveness was beyond the pale or the preserve of the rare saint. Broadly, Ugandans living in the aftermath of violence agree that forgiveness is in principle an appropriate action and have undertaken it frequently. One of the standard charges against forgiveness, reflecting the worry about victims becoming more victimized, is that it is, but should not be, pressured upon victims. The criticism is right. Forgiveness, which depends uniquely upon the inward will of victims, ought not to be pressured. The problem, though, is the pressure and not the forgiveness. 94% of the Ugandans who forgave reported that they were not pressured to forgive, showing that pressure is not endemic to the practice of forgiveness in political settings. And there are indeed other settings where I think one can find this kind of uh, dynamic, but it's not necessary. Contributing to the plausibility of forgiveness in Uganda is a dimension that is per critical to its performance, religion. Ugandans are predominantly Christian and rank high in measures of religiosity. 80% of those who forgave reported, no, sorry, 82% of those who forgave reported having done so on account of their religious beliefs. Forgiveness was equally religiously motivated in one region that was predominantly Muslim. 
This reflects a trend that applies to transitional justice globally, which has taken place predominantly, although not exclusively, among Christian populations in Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, and East Asia. It should not be surprising that religious leaders have been major voices in transitional justice debates and are often advocates of reconciliation and forgiveness. Such was true in Uganda, where 70% of victims who forgave reported that a religious leader encouraged them to do so. The place of religious warrants in transitional justice, of course, is a debate all of its own. A case could be made that religion reframes the concepts of burden, agency, resentment, construction, and right relationship that are at stake in debates about forgiveness. This would require a foray into theology. What is important here is that forgiveness can be understood to be a practice that constructs right, re constructs right relationship and thus arguably has a place in Colleen's formidable theory of transitional justice. Thank you. Thank you.